Thank you for joining us for God's Word for the Modern World, New Beginning Baptist Church's Adult Sunday We've School. We've been talking, we started last week on the, the sword of the Spirit. I wanted to go back every once in a while and just remind us, because we can get lost in the individual verses and the individual piece of armor and, and lose sight about overall what we're talking about when we talk about the whole armor of God. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6 and start with verse 10 and read through these verses again. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith, uh, wherewith uh, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto in all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We remember verse uh, 19 and 20 take us back to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5 where he talks about we're new creatures, right? New creations. And that we're all ambassadors for Christ. So this whole idea of the armor, the ultimate purpose is that we might be effective ambassadors sharing the gospel. Right? And that is spiritual warfare because over in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, it says that God is trying to bring life and Satan's trying to keep people in darkness. That's the crux of spiritual warfare. Now there's all kinds of other peripheral things right, that affect us personally and the wiles of the devil trying to keep us ineffective. But it gets down to what we're going to talk about today, back to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, last week we looked at the sword of the Spirit, and we talked a little bit about how that's both offensive and a defensive weapon at times. Right? When you're in, but the sword of the Spirit gets down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. It's getting down the real battle and a personal one. What we have to do right, to fight this battle. So the sword of the spirit is both defensive and, and offensive. We talked about, of course, the greatest example of how to use the word of God against Satan himself. Right? Was our Lord there in Matthew chapter 4. And, and again, it, it's, it, I thought about this. It keeps coming back to me, Pastor, this week. Yes. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 1. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Holy Spirit led him into the desert to be tempted. What is that saying? The Holy Spirit can lead us into things that we don't particularly like. Right? That don't seem good to us. But what's going on? God is using it for good. And in this case, the good, part of the good, besides many other things that I haven't seen, is the perfect example to us. 
He's showing us how to rely on the Holy Spirit and use the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. When we learn how to do that, we learn how to use the Word of God to fight the, all the wiles of the devil. Just like that shield helps against all those fiery darts. If we effectively use the sword, okay, very personal attacks of the devil. He says, it's going to be effective because look what Jesus did. While he was being led by the Spirit, he used the sword of the Spirit to fight the personal attacks of the devil. That's a great example. So we looked at that last week. Then we looked at uh, the Word of God was powerful. Right? We went to Revelations where it talks about just the, the Word of God coming out of the, Lord, the mouth of our Lord is that sword that destroyed armies. And not just little armies. We're talking about huge armies from around the world, all nations. Right? That's powerful. Just a word. The word of God destroys them. Yet we looked at that same sword of the Spirit, that same word of God, can do that delicate surgery on a heart. Right? And we looked at uh, Hebrews there, the word of Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He can go in and slice and dice very carefully. Now some people say, well, he just went in there and hacked. No, that's not what it's saying. Think about that. He's separating things carefully so that he can get to the intent of the heart. We're going to touch on this again a bit later, but you know, Spurgeon talked about that, right? Yeah, it feels like he's hacking at you when you're lost in hearing the Word of God. But when the final end is, he's done heart surgery, if you will. Delicate heart surgery. So that sword of the Spirit is both. We got down to you know, the, talking about the Holy Spirit uses that word. That's that word of God to show individuals the truth. And show the world the truth. Even though the world doesn't accept it. That's the Holy Spirit's purpose. Right? And he does, he achieves his purpose by using the sword of the Lord. I mean, sword of, yeah, sword of the Lord too, but the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. Turn with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Now I was going to start with verse 7. Let's back up to verse 1. Because sometimes we we've, we've Maybe I'm just talking about myself. But in the past, we've had such a wonderful freedom in this nation to worship God, to let God move on our hearts, to, to feel that we had the freedom to speak when we wanted to. We tend to read verses like verse 1, other verses where he talks about offenses will come. <laughs> we kind of glance over that lightly because we haven't really experienced it. But I think we may. So let's back up to verse 1. He says, These say things I have spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. But well, why would we be offended? Because the world hates the Lord. The world hates the message of the gospel. The world hates Christians because the world is controlled by Satan. Goes back to what we just talked about. Second Corinthians chapter four. God's trying to bring light to the glorious gospel. His Holy Spirit is trying to use the sword of the Lord to help people get saved. And Satan wants to keep them in darkness. That's what he says. So when you share the gospel, 
and you've seen it, you've experienced it, probably experienced it, more lately, last few years, right? people get more and more offended. Pastors even mentioned, even people who claim to be Christians, if you ask them, they get offended. Which makes you wonder. But he says, I've spoken these things unto you that you should not be offended. That ye shall <clears throat> that they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh when whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. We don't think about it here. We've not seen it yet in America. But it doesn't take much looking around. There's places all over the world where this has gone on since the beginning of time. And it's going on today where Christians are being killed for the fact that they're Christians. He says, And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I've told you that when the time shall come, you, sh you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither thou goest. But because I said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled thy, your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Yeah, I'm going to stop there for a minute. I know he's talking to the apostles about their experience at that moment in time, but the parallel to this is for us. I, I get thinking about, again, how easy life has been for us here as Christians in America. And that may change before the Lord comes back and takes us out. Right? That may be who knows how long from now, but we may, I'm just saying may, see some of this. We may see some of it change. And what he's trying to say is, don't get discouraged. If the whole world turns against you, remember, it hated me. It hated me. I'm telling you these things so you don't get offended, so you don't get discouraged. Okay? It's easy for Christians to get discouraged in this day and time when we see what's happening to America. He said, don't get discouraged. That's why I said earlier, that's why I get encouraged when I hear revival going on in other places in America. That's what he's saying here. Anyway, so he says, yeah, so even though he's talking specifically to the apostles and meant for all of them, he says the comforter, notice that, he says, if I, if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. Why is that important? Wouldn't we rather have Jesus with us? No. <laughs> Tell you why. Because Jesus, when he took on flesh, he's confined himself to that body now. And he's risen and gone to heaven. He is one place. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere at once. If Jesus was still here with us, we would have to travel to Jerusalem or wherever else he, he was at to be able to talk with him. To be able to, through the Holy Spirit, he can accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished all at the same time. Make sense? That's why he's saying to them, it's, it's important that I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. If it's that important, we should pay attention to the Holy Spirit. That's why I was saying this morning, it's, it's been striking, striking. We need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit every day in our lives, even the simple things He's doing. And thank Him for the work He's doing. What's the work He's doing? Verse 8, and he will come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment 
because the prince of this world is judged. Notice that he's already judged. The final judgment was at Calvary when he shed his precious blood. And then he died and was buried. And he rose again. That's why he said that he's in heaven. That was the, the declaration that God accepted that final judgment at Calvary. And Satan's doom was sealed for sure. No doubt about it. I just don't understand why he doesn't understand that. <laughs> anyway. He says, because this uh, world, the prince of this world is judged. Now, no one said the prince of this world is judged. Over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, was he called? The God of this world. Uh, lower G. Uh, here he's called the princess. Does, does it sound like he has power in this world? Remember, when he offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world, Jesus didn't say, well, they're not under your power. You don't have power to give me that. He didn't say that. Why? Because he is the prince of this world. He is the Lord G, God of this world, that has people in blindness to where they don't understand. They can't see. They're blind. Well, they said their minds are blind. They don't understand when we share the gospel. That's why we don't need to worry about helping them understand. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to take the sword of the Lord, the sword of the Spirit, and share that gospel. He goes on and said, and that's what he's explaining here. He's going to explain here shortly what he means by verses 9, 10, and 11. Okay? Verse 8. You know, how does the Spirit do these things? He says, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. And that word bear means, has a connotation that you can't even understand them now. You, you, you haven't had enough information to be able to understand all of this stuff completely yet. That's basically what he's saying. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall speak not of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said that he shall take of mine and shall show it to you. So what is he saying? Whatever the word of God is. That's the same word of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same word of the Holy Spirit. The, that's what the Holy Spirit is. That's how... He will. Okay? Show, show, verse 8 said, who will prove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. That's how he does it. Through the word of God. So that sword of the Spirit not only helps us as a Christian to defend ourselves against the onslaught of Satan, that's the defensive part. It's an offensive weapon that we can use in the power of the Holy Spirit to take the gospel, the word of God, that sword of the Spirit, into the world and start defeating Satan. Person by person. Person by person. We're not the Lord. We don't speak the word and wipe out armies. Right? The Holy Spirit uses us, yielding the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to each individual. That's, that's that sword. It's an individual weapon. You fight the devil one on one. When he's got someone locked down in sin, and they're blind, and you start sharing the gospel, the Holy Spirit 
uses that word to start convicting the heart. That's what we were talking about earlier today. That's why I'm praying, Lord, send someone they'll listen to. Send someone that they won't automatically, as soon as you start, just start talking about it, they put up the wall. Send somebody can be effectively used the sword of the Spirit to touch the hearts. That's what he's saying here. That's how the Spirit works. That's what the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is all about. Remember, we just read the verses there in Ephesians. Ultimately, the whole armor is about being ambassadors, being able to share that precious gospel light with others. So that's where the offensive part of this weapon comes in. Uh, I got off track of my notes. Sorry. That's what uh, is, is talked about over in uh, 1 Timothy. Turn with me to 2 uh, Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is what Paul is talking about. Okay? Down in verse 7, he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of, the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of sound mind. That sound mind is important. That's why if you go back and read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, he lumps the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit together, which is the Word of God. It's through the Holy Spirit and us having a sound mind. Okay, through that sword of the Spirit and the helmet of salvation, which is that hope of salvation, those two work together so that we might have a sound mind. Because that's important. He goes on and says, <clears throat> Be thou not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, we read that and often say, okay, there's going to be some afflictions, and by the power of God, I'm going to overcome it. That's true. But think about what we just read over in Matthew. Sometimes those afflictions will come by the power of God to us so that he can use us in that to show someone else the power of God. That make sense? Or did I lose you in all that? In other words, a lot of times these afflictions are God's will. And we blame the devil, and he needs more blame than we give him. Right? And certainly he is the one that's causing the afflictions, and God's letting him. Okay? But God has purpose in everything he does. That's what he's saying here. He says in verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The light through the gospel. How? The Holy Spirit that's given to us gives us that sound mind so that we can share the gospel, that gospel of light. Yeah. Take that sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and share it. That's what he's talking about here. We need to remember Go back to the Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. We need to remember. Okay? Uh, 
that this is called what? The sword of the Spirit. Now notice, go there, notice what he says. In verse 17 it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He says you're to take it. It doesn't belong to you. If you look up that Greek word for take, in some cases it means to receive. In other words, take it from someone else that it belongs to. Okay? So we're told to take that sword which belongs to the Holy Spirit. Who's the author of this word? The Holy Spirit. He says, take this, the blessed light of the gospel. You're to take it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, he could if he wanted to, and there may be some people who claim he did, but not normally. The Holy Spirit doesn't normally appear to people and, and tell them the gospel. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't just appear to people and say, oh, let me share with you three, uh, John 3.16. No, the Spirit doesn't do that. What the Spirit does is relies on us to take that sword and as we go out and share the Word of uh, God, the Gospel of Light with people, then the Holy Spirit's work begins to convict the hearts, to show them what we were over in John. Okay? That sin's been judged. That Jesus is Lord. Right? You need to be saved. Or you're going to share the judgment that's already been sentenced on Satan. The Spirit does that. But only after we take, take the sword from Him and then use it properly. And we're going to run out of time. But we'll, we'll talk just briefly next week about using it properly. <clears throat> Because we can use it improperly. Oh, yes. Yes. And notice, remember we just talked about how sharp that two-edged sword is. Some of you, Bobby, uh, this guy here, Skip, <laughs> you probably have cut yourself on the uh, edge of a, a sheet metal part. You didn't intend it, right? But a sharp edge will get you when you're not, if you're not handling it properly, Right? That includes the sharp two-edged sword of the Spirit. If you don't use it properly, it can do damage. Right? So we need to be careful. What we'll talk about next week then is we need to make sure that when we take that sword, we rely on what it says in verse 10 of Ephesians 6. Okay, that we're being strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And what is the power of God? The Holy Spirit. So we take that sword and we use it according to the power of the Holy Spirit. And let Him do the job. Does that make sense? Hey, we'll stop there and, then, and pick it up next week. Just a few more things on this and then move on to the next verse. Okay. Verses 18 uh, <clears throat> excuse me through uh, 22 are kind of now the part of the reason it's important to have the armor done. This is the last verse specifically about the armor. But verses Six, uh, 18 through 21 tells us, or 22 tells us why that armor is so important. Okay, so we'll touch on those starting next week. Hey. Hey. Thank you for joining us for God's Word for the Modern World, New Beginning Baptist Church's Adult Sunday School class.